Imagine we have an inclined plane and five different objects placed at the top of it. First, there's a hollow sphere, like an empty basketball or a beach ball. Then we have a solid sphere, which you can imagine as a cannonball, which is an iron sphere used historically in warfare. Next is a hollow cylinder, kind of like a ring or a pipe. Then there's a solid cylinder, similar to a mechanical roller. Finally, there's also a cube, but this one is special. It's frictionless, which means it will slide instead of rolling. All of these objects are of the same mass and size, and we'll release them from rest at the same time, from the same height. So, what do you think? Will they all reach the bottom together? Or will one object be faster than the others? I will answer this question at the end of this video or in the next video of this video series, so stay tuned. While circular motion focuses on a point mass moving along a fixed circular path, rotational motion deals with extended bodies, like rods, discs, or wheels, rotating about a fixed axis of rotation. And to fully grasp how these objects move, we first need to understand an important concept called rigid bodies. When we study rotational motion, we usually deal with rigid bodies unless stated otherwise. A rigid body is an object in which the distance between any two points remains constant, even when forces are applied to it. In simple terms, a rigid body doesn't bend, stretch, or deform. Assume we have a body like this. Suppose we have two internal points, A and B, on this body like this, and the distance between these two points is D. Then, if the distance between any two internal points in this body remains constant, regardless of any external forces acting on it, then this body is a rigid body. That means point A and point B stay the same distance D apart. This idea becomes clearer when we look at different types of motion. Let's start with linear, or translational motion. In linear motion, every point on the body moves in the same direction and by the same amount. There's no rotation or twisting. So if the entire body moves 5 meters to the right, both point A and point B also move 5 meters to the right. Before motion, if you draw a straight line from A to B, let's call it line AB, it points in a certain direction. After the motion, this line AB will still point in the same direction, and it will still be parallel to its original position. Now, let's consider the same rigid body with internal points A and B, separated by a fixed distance D. But this time, the body is undergoing rotational motion. In rotational motion, instead of the whole body shifting in one straight line like in linear motion, the body rotates around a fixed axis. This axis could be located within the body, like the center of a spinning disc, or outside the body like the hinges on a door. An important thing to note is that each point or particle of the rigid body moves in a circle centered on the axis, and every point has the same omega or angular velocity and alpha or angular acceleration, but the linear velocity and acceleration will be different. Since the body is rigid, the distance d between point A and point B stays the same throughout the motion. Suppose our rigid body is like this, and it is rotating about its center like this, so this is the axis of this disk. Suppose point A is here, and B is here. Now when the disk rotates, A will rotate like this, along this circular arc, and move here, and B will rotate like this, along this circular arc, and move here. Thus, unlike translational motion, where line AB remains parallel to its original position, here line AB changes its orientation as the body rotates. So, before and after the motion, the direction of AB is no longer the same. Finally, we have a combination of translational and rotational motion. A rigid body both translates and rotates at the same time. A common and relatable example is a wheel or a ball rolling on the ground. 
In this type of motion, every point on the body undergoes circular rotation about its center of mass, while the center of mass itself moves forward in a straight line. That's the translational part. If you assume you are sitting at the center of mass of this wheel, then you will see that you are just translating or moving forward and not rotating, because the center of mass is located on the axis of rotation, while all other points on the wheel are rotating as well as translating. We will talk about this motion in detail in later parts of this series. If the concept of rigid body is clear, then we can jump into the concept of angular force, or torque. Torque, which is described by the Greek letter tau, often described as the rotational equivalent of force, is what causes a rigid body to rotate about an axis. Torque is basically the turning effect of a force. Imagine you are trying to open a door. You know that if you push the door near its hinges, it's much harder to open. But if you push it from the edge, far away from the hinges, it opens easily. Why is that? This is because of torque. The same force can create a stronger or weaker turning effect depending on where you apply it. Now let's try to understand what factors affect torque. There are mainly two things. First is the amount of force you apply. Second is how far from the axis of rotation you apply it. Let's go back to the door example. The axis of rotation is the line where the door is attached to the wall. That's the hinge side. Assume we apply a force perpendicular to door like this at this point, which is shown using this red vector. FP means a perpendicular force. The distance from the axis of rotation to the point where the force is applied is called the position vector, which will be this vector. The force is usually applied at an angle, not always straight out, so we only consider the part of the force that is effective in making the object rotate. This is why the angle between the position vector and the force also matters. In physics, we say torque is equal to the product of three things. The distance from the pivot, the force applied, and the sine of the angle between them. That means torque is equal to R multiplied by F multiplied by sine theta. Here R is the length of the lever arm, F is the amount of force, and theta is the angle between them. If the force is applied exactly in the direction of the position vector or opposite to it, the sine of the angle becomes zero, and so the torque is also zero. That is why if you push directly at the hinge of the door, it doesn't rotate at all. Now, torque is not just a scalar quantity, but it also has a direction. Just like force can push or pull, torque can rotate an object clockwise or anticlockwise. By convention, anticlockwise torque is considered positive, and clockwise torque is considered negative. In vector form, torque equals position vector r cross f that is vector cross product between position vector and the force. Therefore, the direction of the torque vector is not in the plane of rotation, but is actually perpendicular to it. With this understanding, we are now ready to understand the concept of moment of inertia. Just as a force causes linear acceleration in a body, and we have the famous equation F equals M times A which is force equals mass times acceleration. In the similar fashion, torque causes angular acceleration, and we have torque equals I times angular acceleration. Now, what is this I? We will explore that in the next video if and only if this video gets 3,000 likes. I need these likes so that I can get motivation to make more videos in this series. So good!